charged with suffocating her six-year-old daughter. An unspeakable crime. And the mom was in hell and said, right, can't just put The killer sent away for the rest of her life. You didn't smother her. Drive to a deserted road. It doesn't look like anybody did have been Hello? And if you were allowed to testify... She probably never would have been convicted. A mother searches for the truth from behind prison walls. Do you know the murdered Taylor? I think I do, yes. My name is Jerry Pallas. I'm a former NYPD detective. Court TV asked me and my partner, fellow NYPD detective Reggie Brett, to look into the 1991 murder of six-year-old Taylor Ferguson. The murder has sparked controversy in Georgia, igniting claims that the wrong person is behind bars. You have some time now? I want to talk to you about uh, the Ferguson case. On a Sunday evening in June 1991, the child's mother, Teresa Farguson, says she took her daughter to a grocery store in Macon, Georgia. According to Teresa, a few minutes later, she realized that Taylor was missing and she began searching the store. With no sign of her daughter, Teresa became frantic and asked an employee for help. The police were called in and about an hour later, Taylor was found dead by the side of a road in a rural area about six miles away from the store. The investigation dragged on, and over a year later, the police announced that finally they had a suspect. When it was all over, Teresa Ferguson was found guilty of murdering her daughter and sentenced to life in prison. To this day, Ferguson insists that she's innocent and is the victim of a police department cover meant to protect one of their own, a former Macon cop. Ferguson says is the real killer. I'm, uh, I mean, she may be the wrong person. Probably. We won't know till we get there. If Teresa's claims are true, then an innocent woman is behind bars and a child killer is out walking the streets. We went down to Georgia to see if we could find out the truth once and for all. Well, from what we know, there wasn't uh, too much physical evidence, if any. This happened in June, June 1991. Right. This girl wasn't arrested until uh, it was like a, it was a year and a half later. So uh, this guy's her appeals attorney, right? Finley? Yes, he, he is. He's, he's, a, appeal he's the appeals attorney. First stop was in an Atlanta suburb. We wanted to talk to Drew Finley, Teresa Ferguson's lawyer. We'll have to find out from him what he's got. And, uh, yeah, he, could, he should clear up a lot of this for This is the beginning of the journey, man. I want you to give us the facts of the case. Okay. How this happened to Teresa. June 9th of 1991, um, Teresa Ferguson uh, was at home with her six-year-old daughter, Taylor. Uh, at approximately nine o'clock that evening, she gathered her daughter up and took her to a Kroger uh, grocery store. She lost contact with her, started running around the aisles looking for her, and started calling out her name. Immediately, people came to her aid. They started looking. She was not found. Approximately 11 o'clock that night, she was found on a service road on the side of a highway. Um, a deputy coroner showed up. He immediately said, Taylor's been dead from sometime between 7 and 9. All attention was drawn to Teresa Ferguson at that time. Given that she had been at the Kroger sometime past 9, she immediately became a suspect in the case. Okay, so she becomes a suspect at that point? For nine and a half months, she was not arrested. For nine and a half months, there was no evidence found to support that she had anything to do with this death. And what do we have? We've got a woman that, as far as I'm concerned, is sitting in jail for the remainder of her natural life who's innocent. And how anybody in law enforcement and how anybody in prosecution can go to sleep at night knowing what they've done is atrocious. In the summer of 1980, 
Teresa Ferguson moved to Georgia from a hometown of Talladega, Alabama. A few years later, she met Charlie Ferguson. The couple married in February 1984, and 10 months later, Taylor was born. When they divorced in 1990, Teresa took sole custody of Taylor and decided to stay in Macon so that Taylor could be near her father for weekend visitations. Hello, uh, Mr. Charles Ferguson, please. I'm Ms. Ferguson. How do you do? This is Jerry Palace. Okay, uh, I was wondering if it would be possible to come see you. We wanted to speak to you since you're her ex-husband and father of... Uh... Right. Charlie didn't want to talk to us on camera, but he did say that he thought the right person was behind bars. You had stood behind her, but then you changed when, for some reason... And when he took the stand at Teresa's about. trial, it was evident why he turned against his ex-wife. And you are convinced now that Teresa did it on you? She failed three lie detectors tests, didn't she? No, sir, she didn't. Good. I believe she did. No, sir, she did not. Did not. Is that what the police told you? She told me at the grave site. She told you at the grave site? She Teresa did. Grave. Yeah. Okay, Rich, this is it. This is a call, this is it. It was Teresa's second trip to the store that day fact that heightened the suspicions of the police. This is the same time of night. Yeah. 10 o'clock. This is a big That's store. a full-time supermarket. Full this place here. I mean, look, you know, people going in, the cars are moving in and out on a regular basis here, so. On the first trip, she says she purchased the ingredients to make a recipe from scratch. But when it got too late, she claimed she changed her mind and returned to the store in order to buy a ready-made dish instead. Within an hour's time, some woman discovers the body a short distance from here. You know what, let's go, uh, let's go take a look at that. Let's go okay. to the crime scene. Okay. According to the prosecution's theory, Teresa's second trip to the Kroger that night was nothing more than an attempt to create an alibi. They theorized that she killed Taylor between 8.30 and 10 p.m. in her home and then drove to the outskirts of town and dumped the body on the side of the road. This is it. I get an eerie this feeling. Is... Huh? Oh, man. See? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is it. Look at this. Somebody opens the door, just puts the body down right there. Let's takes it out of the... Off this front seat, back seat, whatever, and puts the kid right down. The light shines on this part of the road. It's not even, what, four to five yeah. feet from the pavement. I asked myself, why this person just take the body? You want to? You 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 are leaving it here to be found, right? Yeah, because you're not leaving it here. To. You're not looking to hide anything. If they wanted to, they should have took it a little further and been right. in the woods. I mean, it wouldn't take that long to put a body into the woods. Because this is a pretty deserted road. They wanted it to be found, but maybe not that quick. But they wanted her to be found. Yeah. Man, let's get out of let's here. Get out of here. Makes the hair in the back of my neck stand up, something like this. There's a police officer who had been following us. I mean, do you think he had something to do with it? I do, yes. Teresa Ferguson was sent to prison in 1993, and her first shot of parole was denied in late 2000. If she had taken a plea bargain she was offered before trial, she would have been out by now. Instead, it looks like Washington State Prison, a maximum security facility in eastern Georgia, is where she'll spend the rest of her life. Prior to this happening, uh, she seemed to be a normal all-American person, you know, working, big jobs, trying to raise a kid. I mean, I don't know if she's guilty or innocent, but coming here, I always like to think that, as far as I'm concerned, they're guilty, because they've been proved guilty, you know? In the court of law. Right. Now, I want her to convince us Otherwise, we'll hear what she has to say to us. I want you to take us back. Tell us about that day. Um, we went to the beach and spent the day at the beach. Um, we had gone to a um, one of the little self-serve car cleaning areas to get the sand out of um, my car. I was vacuuming out the trunk, and she came up and handed me this beat-up teddy bear and asked me, could you keep him that a uh, policeman had given them to her. 
that's when all of it started, and it's only been recently that we found out actually what happened. What happened? Um, as far as we can tell, there's a, a police officer, a former police officer now, who had been following us. I didn't know it at the time. Is he the same police officer that gave your daughter that teddy bear? He has admitted that, yes, sir. Did you ever see him? Like, did she say, there, there he is, mommy? Didn't you want to see who gave this to your daughter? I didn't see anybody. There was no one dressed as a police officer. Um, there was no police car. When you refer to this police officer, are you familiar with his name or who he is? James Glover. James Glover. I mean, do you think he had something to do with it? I do, yes. You do? Mm -hmm. You really do. Uh, let's, let's go back to the night at the store when your daughter's missing. What, what happens? We went down um, through the parking lot to the, into the store. Um, I was just kind of talking to her over my shoulder, not really paying much attention. And um, when I got to the deli section, I turned around to say something to her, and she wasn't there. She just wasn't there. What's, what's going through your mind? Your daughter's missing. How did you feel? I was afraid. I was afraid for her. Um, did you murder Taylor? No. Was it you? No. So as people that say you're guilty, what do you tell them? What do you want to tell them? What's happened to me is irrelevant, but the person that did this needs to be punished. That's what I want to see done. That's what gets me through every day. Well, what do you think? She doesn't have me totally convinced yet. How about you? Yeah, I, I feel like that too, because I, you know, I mean, tears. I don't like eye contact. Right, I know, a lot of downtime. Yeah. You think they were crocodile tears? Sure. <laughs> Could have been, you know, I mean, I've seen tears. Maybe there's another side to this woman. So we have to look for a motive. Macon is a fairly small and tight-knit community. And when the trial of Teresa Ferguson got underway, the townspeople were suddenly faced with the question of whether a mother could be capable of murdering her own daughter. When you wake up in the middle of the night, you've had a nightmare. You turn to your mama and console you be there for you. Taylor couldn't do that on June the 9th because the nightmare was real. The monster was her mama. At the time, the prosecutor, Howard Sims, was a young assistant in the district attorney's office. Today, he's the DA. Was there uh, anything that she said to the police or to anyone that made her uh, look like a suspect or act? she acted funny? Uh... She, she never acted like a, a grieving mother, if, uh, if you know what I mean. She seemed to be upset, but she was upset that she was a suspect. She wanted to know what the evidence was and if that evidence indicated that she had done it, more so than she seemed to be concerned about the fact that her daughter was dead. Were you looking at any other suspects in this case? The police went out and started interviewing people from the store. That was where they started. Nobody at the store ever saw this child come in that night. And in fact, there was a witness who saw Teresa Ferguson come through the door alone. And he testified in the trial that the daughter was not with her. Was the husband ever a suspect? No. The husband's whereabouts were fairly iron-cladly accounted for. Um, and I, I believe he was at work that night. The boyfriend was somewhere else. Was he ever a suspect? No, he was never a suspect. She had talked to him, to the boyfriend, earlier that night. Um, they had a fairly extended phone call. It lasted almost 20 minutes. And what I suspect and what we argued at trial was that the two of them had an argument and he took his phone off the hook. My position was that she, she was trying to get back through to her boyfriend and she was trying to get Taylor to go to bed. Taylor wouldn't go to bed. She kept getting up. I think that the frustration just built and built and built until finally the little girl got up. She was the closest thing to take it out on and she grabbed her with the blanket, put it over her face and she suffocated her. They had a tap on her yes. phone. One of those tapes became yes. very critical. That tape, what was on that tape? We played a couple of tapes. One was an hour long conversation between she and her boyfriend during which she whispered